So if you want to find good news, you got to really search hard for it <laughs> or join us at Real Wealth. We'll share it with you. Um, now, this I thought was very interesting. The economy, even though it quote unquote shut down, I remember saying a lot of times, well, did it really shut down or is it just changing? And I, I'm going to still say it's just changing. I, I never believed it shut down because I don't know about you, but I was still eating. You know, I was still buying things. I was just doing it differently. And uh, and so, you know, lots of packages, lots of packages. And I would tip especially high when I received those packages. And um, boy, it's been a long time since we started ordering uh, this thing called territory where they just deliver the meals for you since we weren't really going out. And then we found out, oh, we can really support restaurants and just order to go. So spending just changed, that's all. And if you look at this, this is very surprising to me that uh, from in June compared to January, it only decreased by 8.9%. Isn't that amazing? Again, we don't see a lot of headlines on that. I think there was a lot of belief that the economy just shut down and spending stopped. Well, it didn't. It just did for some businesses. And now we're seeing businesses beginning to open. And uh, businesses open compared to January. Cincinnati is at the top, and I just think that's really incredible. I would not have guessed that, <laughs> that uh, more businesses in Cincinnati have opened than any other place. And it's not because Ohio's been disregarding the rules. They have they, they were the first to jump in on social distancing and stay-at-home orders. They were right up there with California. So it's not that they're just ignoring things. They're just doing it carefully. And, um, and opening, reopening in a way that they can and, and keeping numbers down. So uh, Jacksonville second there, 85%. And Nashville, Austin, Indianapolis, look at that. Orlando, Tampa, Dallas, New York still still suffering there. Not, not as much open there in New York, San Francisco as well, LA. I haven't, I haven't gone out. Uh, we still just ordering to go. <laughs> Gotten very comfortable at home actually. Um, Let's see. So you can see it's just kind of across the board. It's it's different in every city. And we've always said that you cannot look at headline news and make any sense of that. Not when it comes to housing. Housing is different in every market and in every market. It's different. It depends on what side of town you're in. So. Let's see. And there's winners and losers in terms of the kind of businesses that are opening clothing way down. Guess what? Turns out we don't really need that much clothing these days. Yeah, we're all just real comfortable, at least me. I look at my closet and say, why do I have all these clothes? All I want is a nice pair of sweats. So lots of people, um, although my daughter just had her 21st birthday and she demanded that we all dress up. We did a stay at home 21st birthday party for her because there's no bars open. And I'm sure that was not her dream uh, for her 21st birthday. Her dream was Las Vegas, but Las Vegas, maybe not so exciting today. So anyway, she made us dress up. But most people, you can see clothing is down, um, food and, and services down. But over here, look at that. Non-store retailers, meaning basically online way up. So people are still spending money, just doing it differently. I've been trying to not just buy on Amazon, just spread the wealth. I don't know about you, but just, yeah, just going directly to the sellers so that, uh, so that you know, again, spread the wealth. Building supplies way up, my husband says, every time he goes to Home Depot, which is all the time. Uh, it's packed. It's absolutely packed because so many people are just staying home and working on their homes. Uh, food and beverages stores up. People just having little little gatherings at home. Their 21st year old birthday parties at home like us. And then sporting goods and hobby stores up. So, you know, amazing. And then motor vehicles. I was shocked. Down only 4%. Even though I don't know who's driving. I guess somebody's driving, but... Uh, yeah, still down, uh, not down that much. All right, um, although still we're seeing there are continued jobless claims, and you could see on this chart um, this the areas that are kind of more affected than other, uh, other areas, Oregon, Nevada, New York, still pretty affected, um, and, and uh, certain areas less affected by job losses. But what's really interesting, I'm going to just kind of flip between these two slides. This is sales in, you know, just new home sales. And the darker the color, the more the sales. Isn't it weird that sales are up in some of these areas where there were job losses? 
I'm going to go back to the other side. We can see where the job losses are. It's the darker areas. And then look at where the sales are. So this was a very strange metric that came up. I've been confused by just about everything over the last few months trying to figure out why things are working out in our industry better than I would have ever expected. If you talked to me in March or April, I, I mean, probably mostly end of March, because by April we had a good idea that things were, that people had decided that living and staying in a home is probably the highest priority. And, uh, you know, pay, not paying the rent would mean eviction at some point, and nobody wants to end up on the street right now. So um, it was right around early, I guess, end of March that we figured out, oh, okay, our industry is has become very, very, very valuable. And this slide shows it. So even in the areas where there are job losses, new home, pending home sales, way up. Just really surprising. And here's a closer look at it. This is from Metro Study Myers Research. Just love them. They do, they they basically consult on new home developers. And since we are in the new home development industry and uh, also in, of course, the rental industry, we stay on top of this. And this slide is weird. Look at this, Las Vegas, new home pending sales index. Las Vegas at the highest. How could that be? Las Vegas is the hardest hit. Um, from an economy standpoint, I mean, it's basically shut down there. Um, yet home sales, new home sales way up. That's fascinating to me. San Jose, San Francisco, these areas are kind of basically shut down. Yet people are buying new homes. Denver, New York, LA. Just look at that. Cincinnati, Houston. So new homes have, have not you know, they're, they're high priority for people. Of course, that's uh, got builder confidence way up. So that's, that's great. Um, one of the reasons we think that maybe the new home share is up is that there just isn't a lot of existing homes for sale. And um, so this slide, again, from Myers Research shows that uh, from April last year to April of this year, the blue line represents new home sales versus existing from last year. And it is it's just more new, you know, so much of an increase in new home sales in Austin, Raleigh, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, Las Vegas, Nashville, Jacksonville, Orlando, Atlanta, look at that, Tampa, just actually Denver, Denver and Charlotte, in Orlando, they seem to still have uh, existing inventory, but some of these other areas, you're seeing a, a big increase in new home sales. And again, that's because overall resale inventory is down, in some cases, 30% year over year, 30%. So that's, that's like people are just not moving. There's just not inventory. So the inventory that does exist is new. Um, and, and what's interesting is that the, uh, uh, not interesting, it makes sense, that the um, pending sales are in areas that are, are have been marked as high migration, strong migration markets. So look at that, Indianapolis, new homes up, Houston, Jacksonville, that keeps coming up as one of the strongest areas for migration, Tampa. Um, look at Chicago. That hasn't necessarily been a strong place for migration, but new home sales are up. And Dallas, uh, so look at that. Just really interesting. So why would that be? Well, Myers Research did a did uh, basically a survey of builders, and and uh, this is these are the questions that were asked, and it just comes down to thanks to the Fed. Um, it's the mortgage rates that are really helping with affordability and helping people be able to buy these new homes because new homes are typically more expensive than existing homes. But with lower mortgages, more mortgage rates, they're able to afford more. So 80% of the people surveyed said it's the low rates. Um, and 56%, still a high number, resale supply is limited. And new homes are safer. That's obvious reason. It's clean. You can go in. There's not going to be anyone there. There's all kinds of technology that allows you to go into the house on your own with a code, not having to see anybody else, not having to go with an agent. You just can go by yourself and let yourself in. Um, and 28%, like I said, they have realized how important a home is. If they're going to be working at home, staying at home, 
homeschooling, not being able to use facilities, you know, at uh, at their condo or whatever, the home has become has elevated to a new status of importance. Um, and when I said thanks, Fed. I had shown this last time, but the Fed announced unlimited purchases of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries and adds multifamily mortgages to that. So this came out in March. Unlimited. Uh, we'll, we don't know <laughs> what that means. All we know is that the credit market just came to a, well, you can see it there. The purchases are attempts to avoid the credit crunch seen after the collapse of the financial system in 2008, which basically means there was just no money and banks failed left and right. So in order to not do that, the Fed just printed money. It's gone nonstop since then to buy uh, mortgage-backed securities. So there's a market for it because most lenders, they create the loan, but then they sell it off. But if nobody's buying the loan, that's a problem. And then there's no lending. So guess who's buying it? The Fed, you and me basically. Uh, we can talk about that later, but there's unlimited buying of these of these mortgage-backed securities to keep the lending market going. With that said, it's not massive, and it's nothing like in 2005, 2006, and it's not easy to get a loan still. But if you've got good credit, uh, you can you you can if you go conventional, you can get a loan. You can see back in um, 2006, the availability of credit. I mean, it was just ridiculous. We all know that. Then it fell off a cliff. Then nobody could get a loan. That's when the credit crunch happened. And then the stimulus. And uh, and then things opened up a little bit, not a lot. It's been hard to get loans for the past 10 years. You have to really, really qualify and have good credit. And now it just got a little bit tougher. So there's still money out there, but man, you better be qualified. So this is an important graph to look at because you can see, woo, it's so easy to get a loan back then, so much money. And then it came crashing down, there was no money. And if you wanted to get a loan, you had it was very, very strict lending standards. So what we have today is a very, very, very different market than we had 10 years ago. So those of you who are still thinking, boy, I can't wait till the market crashes so that I could buy houses for really cheap, this slide might show you that that may not happen this time around because those who did get loans over the past 10 years had to really prove their ability to do so. Um, it was tough to get a loan. Many did not refi. Uh, so they were holding on to their equity with low payments and aren't in any hurry to move, move right now. Uh, and it's still tough to get a loan, but people are buying. So of course, back then anyone could get a loan when those loans reset to the actual the, the actual payment. I mean, I was in the mortgage industry at this time and I could literally give anyone a loan at a teaser rate. I could qualify my borrower on the teaser rate and knowing that eventually it's going to adjust to the real rate, which might be more than they make. So let me repeat that. I could give someone a loan on a teaser rate, not the real rate, and qualify them on that, knowing that once it adjusts, the payment would be more than they make. It was terrible. And I would tell these people, you're, you're not going to be able to make this payment when it adjusts. And, and they would say, that's okay. I, I'm going to have a different job then, or I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm starting a business and it's going to be better by then, or I'll just refi, take the cash out and use that. So really just horrible lending back then, just stupid lending. And of course that didn't work. It crashed, but that has not been the case for 12 years. For 12 years, it's been tough lending. So don't get too excited about this happening, about another crash happening. It's just not as likely. 